Aloha again, this is Kinson Kuba coming to you from Maui. We're going to be looking at lesson number five, the Word, the Word of God, from Discipleship Study Book number one. If you don't have this lesson in front of you already, go to my website. I'm going to show you the, the website is BibleStudyCD.com. And when you come to this website, you will see this page. And I want you to go to Discipleship Lessons. And I just noticed I made a mistake here. Uh, the word is actually lesson number five. It doesn't really matter. But here it's listed as six. So you click on the word and it'll download this lesson into your computer. I want you to print it up and have it ready. So you pause this video right now. And after you've printed the lesson, um, come back and then we'll study it together. Here's the lesson number five on the word. As we begin, let's ask God's blessing again. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for my friend for joining me today. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us, that, Lord, you would teach us, teach us about your word, from your word. And, Father, that your spirit would lead us and guide us and inspire us and would give us the power and the wisdom to understand and to implement and to put into practice what we learn from your scripture, that we might please you and walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling to which you have called us. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your, with your spirit, fill our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And thank you again for joining me. And let, let's go into God's word and I pray it profitable, profitable for you and this time is beneficial. The Word of God. By way of introduction, here's the question. How long do you think we can survive without eating? Not drinking. We can still drink, let's say we can drink water, but just the food part. How long can we survive without eating? And here's your choices. 1, 3, 10, 20 days, 40, 60, 100. If you checked one day, that's this one right here. I can see you've never missed a meal in your life and you could not survive more than a day. No, it's not even 10 or 20. We can survive 40 days without food. But after that, our bodies begin to starve and death is not far off. In fact, what happens is our body begins to eat itself. And that's not beneficial at all, as you can imagine. So 40 days. And interestingly, that's how long Jesus fasted in the wilderness. Just as our physical bodies need food to grow and survive, even so, our spirits need to be fed as well. Notice how the metaphor of milk and solid food are used in Scripture. And we're going to look at these two verses, Hebrews 5.12 and 1 Peter 2.2. 1 2. Hebrews. Scripture says, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. He's speaking to Christians who've been Christians for a while. And he's telling them, you know, by now you should be mature enough so that you can teach other people. But no, you're like we saw in the previous lesson, the baby didn't grow. And so he says, you still need milk instead of solid food. And then First Peter, Peter tells us, like newborn babies, Crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now what is he talking about again? He's talking about the Word, that the milk is the Word. Underline what Hebrews 5.12 means by the metaphor milk. What does is, what is the, um, the, the writer of Hebrews mean by the metaphor milk? Look at this verse again, Hebrews 5.12. Underline what it means by milk. Did you, what, what did you underline? Did you underline the elementary truths of God's Word? He says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk. And there he ties it in with this phrase right here. The elementary truths of God's Word, that's milk, according to the writer of Hebrews. And if you, I, did, I don't have the context, but if you continued reading to, to verse 13, you'd be surprised what the writer considers elementary truths of God's Word. 
Some, some, some of those we would think, oh, is that elementary? It looks more like intermediate or advanced. Now I want you to circle how we are to crave pure spiritual milk according to Peter. How should we crave this pure spiritual milk? Did you underline or circle like newborn babies? Have you ever had a child? I'm sure many of you have. But you know when babies are hungry and they want to eat, what do, the, what do they do? Do they just lie in their cribs on their back and they fold their hands and they just smile at you? No, they start screaming and crying and wriggling and like, give me my milk, give me my milk. That's what they want. They're craving the pure milk. They want, the, of course, the real milk. But we need to be like that. I want the milk. I want the milk of God. Of course, I'm not asking you to scream and cry and, and wiggle around. But that same desire, that same craving that a newborn baby has for milk should be in us too, for spiritual milk. Now, in this lesson, you will learn the source of the Word, the purpose of the Word, the power of the Word, and then the application of the Word. So let's continue and look at the source of the Word. Where does the Word of God come from? This is the definitive verse in Scripture that explains that. There are others, but this one is a de definitive one. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So we're going to look at that. Here's what it says. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's a great verse, isn't it? I want you to circle the source of Scripture according to this verse. Where does Scripture come from according to this verse? Look at that verse and circle that source. Did you see it? All Scripture is God breathed. God breathed. Maybe in your version of the Bible it says, is inspired of God. That might be, an, that might be what you have in your Bible. But in this version it's, all Scripture is God breathed. The Greek word translated God breathed is used nowhere else in the New Testament. Though the word does not explain how Scripture was given to us, it does indicate the supernatural and divine origin of it. Scripture comes from God. In fact, uh, in the versions that say it's inspired of God, I once went to a lecture when I was in the Philippines by a theologian, Carl Henry, and his uh, specialty was uh, bibliology, the study of God's Word. And he's, in fact, he's wrote, written a multi-volume work just on that one topic. And I remember him saying one, in one of the lectures that, that the theologians kind of took offense at the word uh, inspired of God. It should be expired. All scripture is expired of God. But because the word expired, it almost has a connotation of dying, of death to be expired. They didn't want to apply that to God, so they say inspired by God. But really it's expired. It's God breathed. God breathed it out. It's like the breath. It comes from God's breath. And that's where the word comes from. Circle how much of Scripture is from God. According to this verse, how much of it is from God? What one word describes the amount of Scripture that is God breathed? Ah, it's right here. All. All Scripture is God breathed. Not just part of it, not just some of it. I know there are people that say, well, some of it is inspired of God, but not all of it. My question would be, well, who determines which part is not inspired of God or God breathed? That becomes a very difficult thing. All scripture is God breathed, every part. This verse teaches that every scripture in the Bible originates from God. It's inspired by God. Now let's look at the purpose of the word. What's the purpose? When we read 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, again that same verse, and write the four ways scripture is useful to us in the blanks below. There are four things right here that this verse says. And what were they? Let's look at it right here. God's word is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training. And those are the four words you want to put here. It's useful for teaching. Teaching is instructing us in the truth of God. For rebuking, 
is convicting us of the truth of God. For correcting, it's restoring us to the truth of God. And for training, teaching us how to live the truth of God. Do you see the pattern right here? It teaches us the, the truth of God, but if we stray from it, then it rebukes us and then it convicts us. And as we turn back to God, it corrects us. It teaches us what we're supposed to be doing. It restores us. And then it trains us. It teaches us how to live out that truth. Okay, I wanted you to underline the result of these four activities of the Word of God. And then circle how many good works we will be equipped for. Let's look at that. What's the result? If, we've, if we allow God's Word to teach us, to rebuke us, or convict us, to correct us, and to train us, what will be the result? It says it right here, ah, so that, the result, the man of God, the woman of God, may be thoroughly equipped. Isn't that amazing? The man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped. That's the result. You know, when I um, chose a Bible college to attend, I chose Mount Noma School of the Bible. Now, today it's called Mount Noma Bible College or, and Seminary because they had a motto that caught my eye. And the motto was this, if it's Bible that you want, then you want Mount Noma. And I like that because that's what I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn the Bible. I didn't want to learn about the Bible or all these other peripheral things. I wanted to learn the Bible. Why? Because I wanted to be thoroughly equipped to serve God and to teach God's Word. And that's what it takes to be equipped, to, to learn the Word. You can do it right in your home by reading and reading and reading again and again the Scripture and filling your hearts and your minds with it. And then what, what else did it ask us? Circle how many good works we will be equipped for. What does it say right here? For every good work. When you become thoroughly equipped, you'll be equipped for every good work if you have gained the knowledge of the Word of God. How do we do that again? By allowing it to teach us, rebuke us if, if we stray, correct us and turn us back, and then train us. And as we keep walking in God's Word, we will be equipped, equipped for every good work. Isn't that great? Praise God. Let's pause this lesson right here. We're going to stop part one, and we're going to continue on with part two. And so I'll join you on part two.